All right, Patrick, next topic of conversation is BC's naughty list. Not Santa's naughty list. That's a different thing. We'll talk about that closer to Christmas. But right now, we've introduced something called BC's naughty list. This is, I think, one of the first provinces, Patrick. By the way, this is going to happen across the country, I, I believe. I, I think, well, not that I believe. This is, this is essentially the stated goal by the provincial governments, is they're coming out with naughty lists. And if those particular cities that are on the naughty list are not hitting their housing targets, uh, they're going to be placed on this naughty list and their funding is going to get cut. That's essentially what this means, right, Patrick? Well, it's not that their funding is going to get cut. It's actually that their funding, they're not going to get funded for infrastructure projects. Here you go, one for you. Um, and none for Gretchen Wieners. Bye. Provincial government in this case says, okay. You're, you're a classic politician again. It's the same thing as the funding being cut. You just said the same thing, you just said it differently. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm just repeating what the politicians are sharing with us. This is a classic uh, politics over policy kind of view. When you look at the chart, you know, the, the provincial government says, OK, you need to hit these numbers. We need more housing. So municipalities, here's the numbers you got to hit. And if you don't hit those numbers, we're not going to fund some of your bigger projects. And all good. And it all looks very impressive. It all makes for good headlines. It makes like, look at us. You know, we're we're working hard on that housing problem. And the reality of it is, is that they've set everybody up for failure. There is enough hope in hell that they can hit any of these numbers, given interest rates, given builders, given labor. I mean, there's just not enough to go on to hit these numbers. So it's a classic case of the disconnect between what the ask is and what the reality is of being able to deliver on it. So like I said, good headlines, good politics. They're going to be able to blame the municipalities. We told you back in 2023, we need to hit these targets. You're not stepping up, blah, blah, blah. It's all a big story. They're not going to hit these numbers. There's not a hope in hell, but it makes for good headlines. You know, this is actually a really good point, Patrick. You know, it's very rare that you make good points, but this is a good one. <laughs> the shade wow. of it all. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. What I mean by that, I'm just kidding. But what I mean by that is, is this, you know, I often talk about incentives. You know, I think that for a system to work well, you have to have the right incentives. And this is a good example of, you know, the, the, the province issues housing targets. But you just said, and it's very, very wise, is that the municipality is not in charge of, of those housing targets. It's people like us. It's real estate investors. It's developers that decide to do projects now it is the city's job to push those projects through that's where by the way they fail miserably every friggin one of them just about how can we measure that patrick how can we measure the impact the city truly is having because if a municipality was to reduce the lag reduce the timeline increase the, the ability to get through zoning faster issue building permits faster if they did that it would encourage us developers me being one of them that's, I agree, is only one small part, Patrick, because interest rates have to be right and so on and so forth, but and financing has to be right and so on and so forth. But the one thing the municipality can control is that process. And my question is, how do you design a system to incentivize that which they can control? Because they can't control housing starts, but they can control the process of which they can they do control. Well, the, the, the challenge we face, I know uh, I'm, I'm happy to throw bureaucrats under the bus any given day because I'm just not a fan of bureaucracy and the problems that it causes. You know, bureaucracy, we know, is that at some point uh, they have to justify their jobs. So they make things sticky. They make it more difficult. They get into their egos and they do the power trips and, you know, they sit around and pontificate and have actually no connection to what the reality of uh, somebody like you is a developer or developers in general are facing and the challenges. So they get this provincial command, if you will, and they say, okay, you got to do this or you're not going to get this. And nobody's really qualified within, I shouldn't say nobody. There are very few qualified within a municipality to actually take this project on and drive it through bureaucracy, get rid of it. You need a really strong mayor. You need somebody that has experience from a, even a business point of view. Most will go to that. Well, we need more bureaucracy. We need more checks and balances. We need to control this more. And that's really what shuts things out. That's the first phase is clean out bureaucracy and, you know, streamline the process and making sure that you're not compromising quality and some of the, you know, the, the things that we need to do as builders, right? That's the first thing. So I agree with you, but my question to you is, uh, because you're you're very wise because of your 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 years in business. I'm, I'm an old is, guy. Listen, how do you do that? What do we measure 
in order to, you know, essentially the province is saying, listen, we are not going to fund some of your municipal projects if you don't hit these housing starts. I'm saying, okay, that's a that's a, that's a stick, right? That's not a carrot. Actually, they have a stick and a carrot. We're we're presenting this wrong because the the province also says, I know they do in Ontario, if you do hit the housing starts, we'll give you extra funding. So there's the carrot. And if you don't hit them, we'll remove funding. That's the stick. So they are using a stick and carrot approach. I just think they're measuring the wrong thing. My question to you is, what should they measure? Is it time in process? Is it, what? Well, what is it? Well, I think there's a couple of things that has to happen. You know, when you look at a strong economic development uh, kind of department, if you will, is you need to sit down with the developers. You actually need to sit down with them and have an open mind to what they need to get through the process. Mostly they don't even know what their sticky spots are. So it's like, they, they work in a vacuum and until, and I'm not saying everybody's guilty of this. I, I realize I'm generalizing, but if you sat down with the builders, if you actually sat down with the guys that are, you know, putting the boots to the ground, going for the financing, putting these projects in place, ask them what's in the way. You know, that's the first thing that they need to do. If they sat down, I mean, let's let's face it, JG. You, I mean, you're a small developer. You make a difference in Peterborough. You do your thing. When was the last time economic development reached out to you or you were able to reach out to economic development and say, hey, listen, if you want me to build stuff, I'm happy to do it. I can do a six plex. I can do an eight plex. I can work on densification. Here's what I need in order to achieve that. Anybody ever done that with you? Nope. Okay, so that would be the first thing. The next thing is, is when you look at this, you know, well, we dropped GST, you know, 5%. It's really, when it nets out, it's going to be like guys who do math and who really look at these things say the net effect is like less than 1% or less than 2%. It's not that big of an initiative. Why isn't the government who's acknowledged that there's a housing problem? Why don't they look at these developers, work with the Bank of Canada, work with CMHC and say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to provide builders low rent interest loans. And this is how they have to be to qualify for those loans. And we will lend the money at 3%, 4%, whatever the number is, not at 8% or 9% or 10%. Like that's where the block is happening for builders is that they have to get capital and whether they do it privately, whether they do it for, through the bank, given what's going on, they are paying you know, really high rates and then they can't pencil. The projects don't pencil. When they're done, what do they do with them, right? That would for sure help. And that, that would be very helpful. And then I think on the city side, you know, they really have to. Now, I got to say that the, the, what the Ford government did with the three units instead of, you know, three units being by way of right, as they call it. Now it's part of law. Uh, that's a huge help, especially to a guy like for sure that that has saved some of my projects that I was holding off saying, I'm not going to do this because I know I'm going to be in zoning for 18 months for for 24 months. Now I'm putting those projects at the front of the at the front of the pile. But now the financing's too expensive, but that's OK. The financing will come back because we can control that a lot more than we can control the zoning. But we need more of those kinds of laws to speed up that process, including the building permit process. Okay, got it. So let's just think this through. You said it yourself. They've done that and that's great. You celebrate that and so great, awesome. A lot of builders probably will. But then you run into, well, okay, but interest rates are high, but that that shall pass, okay? So right now you may be touching the break and most builders are touching the break because they're waiting for rates to come back down, saying they got to come back down at some point. But then a year passes, 18 months passes, two years pass, and... What could they have done in that period of time? My point is this, is now government is not getting their taxes. They're not getting their transfer taxes. They're actually short selling themselves, if you will, or shorting themselves in terms of revenue that they can generate because we need housing because they're not upping manufacturing. Let's face it, they're not upping manufacturing. They're not upping productivity. They're not doing a bunch of exports. So where's the revenue coming in? And now they're cutting off their, their nose in spite of their face. My point is, Take that initiative that uh, Doug Ford put in and Vancouver region put in and say, OK, we're going to streamline this to get units in and we're going to do a short term. The Bank of Canada is going to cover it. The government's going to cover it or they do bonds or whatever they do. And they do a low rate for builders. Now, here's the key. They get builders building. And then ultimately, what does that do? It's re igniting the tax revenue that our government so desperately needs. And we rescue the part of the shorting housing or the housing shortage, I should say, the shortage of housing and get it in the queue now, as opposed to in a year from now when rates might go down. So a, a long winded way, but it's like, 
there's just such a disconnect between all of it that uh, you can't, the government that's creating a problem isn't going to fix the problem. That's, you know, ultimately the answer. This is why I've said repeatedly, Patrick for Prime Minister. That's my slogan. Patrick for Prime Minister. Uh, that's my slogan. And by the way, folks, if you're watching this and you agree, Patrick for Prime Minister, put it in the comments. Let's get a campaign going. I think we can convince Patrick to run for Prime Minister. You would be thinking wrong. Anyways. But now let, let's end on this chart, Patrick, which just uh, puts graphically what we talked about a couple weeks ago on the last episode, uh, some of the housing shortages, which they talked about uh, across, you know, across Canada. But here's a chart by province of A, where we're at. The blue, the blue boxes is what's projected to increase, right? By the way, that's just the projection. If you look at the, if you remember the original uh, graph that we showed about construction investment, how it's essentially falling off a cliff. I'm actually scared we're not even going to hit the blue box, by the way, Patrick. That's a real, I think that's a real reality. We may not hit the blue box. And then the kind of orange box, that's what we're missing to get to what they call affordability. I find that an interesting, uh, an interesting kind of play on, on how they're looking at this chart. But still, the point is we are in a massive shortage. And you have been saying it for years, Patrick. We don't, this isn't going to change. This is not going to change. Like you say, we go back to what I just said. You know, the, the government that's causing the problem, and I think it's just government, as much as I'm not a fan of our current federal government, I don't care what government it is. As soon as you put government to, to, that's causing the problem and expect them to fix the problem, then you just know that it's going to stay status quo. So what does all this mean? For those of you who are still listening, as investors, look for those opportunities. Be the rental housing provider to fill the gap, the increasing gap of a lack of affordable and or even housing in general. Uh, that's why this is still a great strategy for that financial future. Invest in real estate. We need it. And there's a huge demand. You got clients lined up to get into good units. Patrick for Prime Minister. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. If you like what you learned here, go to the description below and subscribe for our free insiders newsletter where you can also stay up to date for our upcoming events and our courses. If you want to see more stuff like this, click here. If you want to see the entire show, click there.